glad you're with us. It's the top of the hour. Welcome to Inauguration Day in America. I'm Poppy Harlow. And I'm Jim Shudo. Quite a day. Just hours from now, Joe Biden will be sworn in as the 46th president of the United States. He will lead a nation divided like never before in modern times, facing the worst health crisis in 100 years, and yet hope for change, a different approach. President like Biden's first gesture upon arriving in Washington was to pay tribute to the nation's 400,000 coronavirus victims. It was quite a moment. You see it there. A somber ceremony at the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool, a respectful one, calling on the nation with an important message to heal. Yeah, I think that's an image. To heal, we must remember. It's hard sometimes to remember. But that's how we heal. It's important to do that as a nation. Today's transfer of power is unprecedented. Washington, D.C. is on lockdown this morning. 25,000 members of the National Guard are all over the streets. Fencing is up. Bridges are totally closed. Two weeks after President Trump incited the mob of supporters that stormed the Capitol, the president has now decided to snub the Bidens. He has no plans to come to the inauguration or meet the incoming president or welcome them to the White House the way he was welcomed by the Obamas. His final move in the Oval Office was to grant a number of pardons and commutations overnight. More on President Trump's final plans before he leaves office in a moment. But let's begin with Jessica Dean, our colleague on soon-to-be President Biden's schedule this morning. What's about to happen? Well, good morning to both of you. Listen, if you talk to Biden aides, they are ready to get in there and ready to get to work. President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, uh, very much the same. And we're getting some new details about Biden's schedule today that kind of illuminate some of these key differences that we're going to begin to see on day one between a Biden administration and a Trump administ administration. Uh, President-elect Biden starting this morning off attending a church service. Uh, he will be accompanied by bipartisan congressional leadership. He reached out and invited uh, everyone uh, there to attend, including Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. So that will be interesting to see them in this show of unity. Of course, then we have the inauguration itself. He's going to be signing those executive orders we've been talking about uh, from the Oval Office later today. Uh, he'll also take part in an inauguration celebration later today. And interesting to note, Jim and Poppy, they are bringing back the daily briefing. Press Secretary Jen Psaki is promising to hold a briefing later today and every weekday going forward. All of this a lot of change from what we've seen from the Trump administration. And the president-elect talked earlier today as he departed his home state of Delaware before he takes the oath of office about being part of this change, about breaking barriers. Take a listen. Twelve years ago, I was waiting at the train station in Wilmington for a black man to pick me up on our way to Washington, where we were sworn in as president and vice president of the United States of America. And here we are today, my family and I, about to return to Washington to meet a black woman of South Asian descent to be sworn in as president and vice president of the United States. And all of this so important to President-elect Biden. He's talked a lot about how important he believes it is for his cabinet to look like America, is how he's put it, Jim and Poppy. And it was notable, too, to see him today in Delaware as he left his beloved home state. We hear him talk about Pennsylvania and growing up in Scranton, of course, but, but Delaware is where he became a senator. It has been his home for decades and decades. He grew emotional as he prepared to come back here to Washington, D.C., a place where he spent so many years of his life life, but never like this. Of course, never as president of the United States, Jim and Poppy. Yeah. Jessica Dean, thanks so much for the great reporting. With us now, David Sword, look, assistant editor at the Washington Post and Margaret Tollev, managing editor at Axios. And guys, thank you for getting up so early to be with us on such an important day. Um, Margaret, you know, what, what we just heard from Biden talking about meeting Obama to be the vice president, then meeting Senator Harris soon to be the vice president, and the history that both of those moments made. Um, today, 
Kamala Harris will be sworn in as vice president by the first Latina uh, justice on the Supreme Court, Justice Sotomayor, and her hand will be placed on Thurgood Marshall's Bible. It, it's just such a stark contrast to the last four years and says so much about what is ahead, does it not? I think that's right. I, uh, I covered both terms of President Obama and uh, his campaign and his inauguration day as well. I re remember that, and I think anyone who has spent five minutes with Joe Biden assumed that if he ever became president, he would take his own Amtrak ride in. We have a different kind of morning here. Uh, but I do think that um, both with Joe Biden and with Kamala Harris, this represents its own kind of history for Biden. It's a half a century of just slow, incremental, concerted movement towards this moment. For, for Harris, um, a, a rocket ship of a ride politically, but she embodies so much of that sort of continuation of Barack Obama's dream. Uh, I live in southwest Washington. My condo is attached to Thurgood Marshall's former church. So uh, wow. it's really... Wow. To sort of be a part of that moment, just I want to walk out the door. It looks different than when Thurgood Marshall was part of this church, but it is uh, his church active in the community here. A real moment in history, but I think what you saw <clears throat> and what you're going to see today, uh, because it has to be so muted, both because of COVID uh, and because of the, the threat to public safety that, uh, that January 6th made everyone yeah. aware of, it is then the sort of also this forced reset for uh, for Biden and for Harris to a much more austere. This is like less of a coronation, less of a victory lap, and more of a real mm -hmm. moment to say that's not what this is about right now. It is yeah. about yeah. beginning to try to bring uh, sort of warring factions of this country together. Uh, there's going to be a lot of that in the ceremony today, kind of going out in the country. Right. Not, not just so much about the man, as we as we saw uh, in the Trump presidency. D David, a, a moment for, for, for hope here, because Margaret, of course, mentioned Thurgood Marshall's church. Church. First thing Joe Biden's going to do on the day of his inauguration is go to church. He's going to go to mass uh, St. Matthew's Cathedral here, the Catholic uh, church downtown, with notably several Republicans, including Mitch McConnell. Um, tell us of the importance of that, you know, both the symbolism, but the substance Right of that moment and and what it may hopefully, right uh, foreshadow in the coming weeks and months. Yeah. Good morning, Jim. I just want to follow on on Margaret and say the other thing about uh, Vice President Elect Harris that I think hasn't been played up as much is the fact that we finally have a woman as Vice President. Never, still haven't had a woman as President, but that's a major milestone in terms of President Elect Biden going to church. He's a religious person. He comes from a time in the U.S. Senate where members from different part from the two parties had closer relationships, even if they fought on issues, they were friends, they socialized together, they played cards together in the, you know, off hours. And that Senate has gone away, but Biden still wants to resurrect those relationships. Um, I expect him to try and be a uniter in his speech tomorrow because that's his nature. The question is, whether, and, and uh, our colleague S.E. Cup made this point earlier in the evening, whether there are parts of the country that want to be united, and that yeah. is going to be the real challenge. And do, are the political realities such that there is no political incentive, right, to, to actually do something w with those sim the symbols of, uh, you know, coming together, healing, etc.? Right. David Swerdlick, Margaret Talib, thanks so much to both of you. And please do stay with us because we've got more questions for you. Joe Johns, he's at the White House now for more on the final hours of President Trump's presidency. Joe, uh, we saw him unleash a wave of expected pardons earlier. What else in the final hours of the Trump presidency? Well, you know, he is not doing a lot of stuff. He's not meeting with <laughs> Joe Biden, who's right across the street. He is not going to the inauguration, but what he is doing is he's going off to Joint Base Andrews for his big send-off. Not sure how many people are going to show up there. They sent a, a bunch of invitations, and a lot of people have told CNN they're not going, partly because of hard feelings, including uh, the vice president. Of course, he's not going as well. Now, about those pardons, uh, we do have 143 total, which includes pardons and commutations, something like 73 commutations, which means a reduction of sentence, and 70 full pardons, which are essentially uh, a complete absolution 
if you will, for this crime. Now, who's on the list? Steve Bannon. That, of course, is a big name from the administration at the very beginning, a top aide over at the White House. He was charged and faces a trial if uh, he didn't get this pardon on the grounds of uh, defrauding people who thought they were giving money to help pay for the president's border wall. A couple of others, Elliot Broidy, who is an unregistered agent, he was charged with that, and Paul Erickson, uh, that also is a Republican uh, uh, operative, if you will. Back to you. Joe, thank you for the reporting very much. I know you've been up all night, like most of us. Thanks for being here. David is back. Margaret is back. Margaret, um, did the president just make his chances in the, in the Senate trial over impeachment um, less strong now among Republicans because he, because he pardoned uh, Bannon, who said mm. the day before the insurrection, all hell is going to break loose tomorrow? Uh, Poppy, you know, I think it's a good question. Bannon uh, is a major thorn in Mitch McConnell's side. And yeah. we've seen the Senate Majority Leader, the outgoing Senate Majority Leader, uh, but the Republican leader in the Senate. Um, we have seen him uh, increasingly speak out uh, critically about Trump and Trump's role in in inciting the insurrection at the Capitol. I think part of Mitch McConnell's play um, in terms of how he has dealt with the impeachment coming over to the Senate has been able to leave himself the option of rallying Republicans uh, to join for a conviction with the president without committing to it. And that's part of what we're going to see in these closing days. The more and more we find out about uh, the planning or any you know steps, uh, any coordination ahead of that insurrection, I think also is going to play a role. So uh, I don't know that that's going to happen, but I don't think that Steve Bannon <laughs> particularly enamored Mitch McConnell to how to treat President Trump after this, you know, and I think that's just there. The fact that McConnell and Kevin McCarthy are going to join Biden at church, the fact that Mike Pence is going to skip uh, the president's send on ABA to be part of Joe Biden's inauguration shows us the potential, and I want to caveat it, the potential <laughs> for a bit of a reset um, towards you know, some kind of working together, just right. an outright partisan warfare that we're seeing every day. David, because this president so rarely bothered with the effort of legislation, uh, except with the exception of the tax cuts, you know, a lot of his measures were executive orders, regulation changes, et cetera, which Biden can and intends to, to reverse very quickly. The, the, the Muslim plan, ban, that's going to go away, for right. instance. A lot of these regulatory changes, particularly environmental ones. Um, what then is the most, and a lot of things that, the, that Trump, of course, promised to do didn't happen. I mean, for instance, the wall, just tiny sections of that actually built. What then is the most lasting legacy in terms of, you know, not, not just you know, the lies, et cetera, but actually actual legislation, actual policy moves. So, Jim, you know, I think that even though President Trump is going to go down as an ineffective president, he did follow through on promises in a weird way. He pushed the tax cut. He tried to get the wall, but failed. Um, he promised xenophobia and anger and overturning the apple cart, he did that. That's not legislation, but that's what a lot of his supporters liked about him. You can go on down the list. Um, I think if you look at a Biden administration, they are going to be able to take those couple of initials. Sour. There's a lot happening today. President Trump may be leaving the White House, but that does not mean he gets to leave his legal troubles behind. Far from it. Will Senate Republicans break with the president and vote to convict? Also in Washington, D.C. this morning, tens of thousands of troops, bridges, streets shut down. Next, a look at the huge security operation underway just ahead of inauguration today. Plus, chilling text messages and instructions on how to make bombs. Authorities dish out a new round of charges against suspects in the Capitol Hill attack. The plot looks worse, more organized, more dangerous. The details next.